All right, it's certainly a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I always hate to be the last one on the program. I know everybody's tired after a long day, but this is a, I, I think this is one of the, the key presentations that really kind of helps you put things together. And what we're going to talk about is different forage species that we can use within a grazing system. And you've seen kind of some numbers like this, but when we look at the cost associated with producing a calf in a cow-calf system, it's going to be about divided up about 56% or about two-thirds of that cost. A little bit over half to two-thirds is going to be in winter feed cost. So that's things like hay and supplement. And there's lots of other items in this cow-calf budget. There's things like equipment and a replacement bull in vet and medicine and salt and mineral and so forth. But those are all pretty small pieces of that pie. So if we really want to impact the profitability of a, a cow-calf system, what we have to attack is that biggest piece of the pie, and that's winter feed costs. So anything that we can do to reduce that big piece of that pie, that winter feed cost, is going to increase the profitability of a cow-calf system. This is a simple slide, but I think it gets an important point across, is that the good Lord gave us some really efficient forage harvesters here in the form of these cattle. They replace a tractor and a rake and a hay baler and so forth. They even fertilize as they go along, and they don't even use much diesel fuel. So anything that we can do that's going to allow us to let them harvest their own forage more days of the year is going to, in general, increase the profitability of our grazing system. Don't worry, I'm not going to go over all the forages on this list, but these can all be grown in Kentucky. What we're going to do is go over some of the um, more prominent ones. And we'll talk about some, some different forages like alfalfa. We talked a little bit about alfalfa, Bermuda grass, corn, crabgrass. And we'll kind of go through those and we'll talk about how they can fit into a grazing system. So in general, when we talk about grasses that we can grow in Kentucky, uh, they can be divided into two basic classes, cool season grasses, things like orchard grass and tall fescue, that's our primary pasture base in Kentucky, and then warm season grasses. And they could include things like Bermuda grass, sorghum Sudan grass, pearl millet. Cool season grasses have optimum photosynthesis, so they're going to have maximum photosynthesis when the leaf temperature of that plant is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're going to grow during the coolest time of the year. They're going to tend to be more digestible and higher in crude protein. And they're going to have a, a longer total growing season in a transition zone state like Kentucky. Warm season grasses are not going to reach peak photosynthesis until leaf temperature of around 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're going to grow right in the middle of the summer months. They tend to be less digestible and lower in crude protein because they're more efficient at using nitrogen because of their photosynthetic pathway. They're more drought tolerant and they're more water use efficient. So they're going to produce, um, they're going to produce about twice as much dry matter per unit of water used compared with the cool season grass in summer months. And, and you're saying, well, why, why do I want to know that? Well, if you're irrigating, if you have limited irrigation capacity, say you're on an old tobacco farm and you want to irrigate some pasture in the summertime, you're much better off to irrigate a warm season grass because you're going to get about twice as much response to that irrigation water. It's also important to know because if we have limited rainfall in the summertime, those warm season grasses will produce more dry matter per unit of rainfall than a cool season grass during the summer months. This is just a nice depiction of the temporal nature of a cool and warm season grass. This was taken in March, and we have on this side tall fescue, a cool season grass. It's up and cranking in March. We've got a little bit piece of alfalfa here in the back. And then over here, we've got Bermuda grass. This is not dead, it's just dormant. It's a warm season grass that hasn't started to grow yet. It's not warm enough for that grass. Now in the middle of the summer, this is going to be green and, and growing at this optimal growth rate where this will be kind of semi-dormant during the summer months because of the high temperature. This is the forage distribution for our uh, best adapted cool season grass, and that's tall fescue. 
it's a bimodal distribution. It means we have two humps. So we've got um, a hump of growth in the spring, and then not much going on in the summertime, and a second hump in the fall. And that's a typical growth curve for a cool season grass like tall fescue, orchard grass, perennial rye grass, Kentucky bluegrass. We'll all have similar growth curves to this. Now, one thing that we can do in a grazing system is we can come in and we can use a summer grass or a warm season grass uh, during the summer months. And it's a very nice complement to the growth curve of our cool season grasses. During the summer months, our growth of our cool season grasses, um, even if it's not restricted by moisture or rainfall, it's restricted by high temperature. Photosynthesis just becomes very inefficient in cool season grasses during the summer months. In a summer grass, like a sorghum Sudan grass, or a crabgrass, or Bermuda grass, or native warm season grass, can fill in very nicely during the summer months when the productivity of our cool season pastures is relatively low. So let's talk about some specific um, species. And tall fescue is um, by far our best adapted cool season grass. Love it or hate it, it's just the best adapted grass we have. And um, no matter how much we curse it, it's weaned more calves in states like Kentucky than any other grass has. The question is, is, is um, what do we do with it? Do we view it as a blessing or as a curse? I like to think a blessing and, and then think about how, how can we optimize it within our grazing system. And uh, we do that by focusing on management. We want to go in, we want to make sure our soil fertility is good. We want to make sure that we're managing for legumes and our tall fescue seeds. That's going to enhance animal growth. It's going to dilute uh, toxins from tall fescue toxicosis. If it makes sense, it doesn't always make sense, but if it makes sense, uh, incorporating a novel endophyte tall fescue into our grazing system may be a really good choice. And then um, probably one of tall fescue's strongest and most underutilized attributes is stockpiling for winter grazing. Of all of our cool season grasses, orchard grass, Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, out of all of those, tall fescue is best adapted for stockpiling. One of the reasons it's so well adapted for stockpiling is that the, the temperature requirement for tall fescue growth in photosynthesis, you guys hear me okay? For growth and photosynthesis are slightly different. I think my... Uh, Battery may be going dead here. So um, I'll change it in a second if it uh, keeps fading out. So the, one of the reasons that tall fescue is so good for stockpiling is the temperature requirement for growth and photosynthesis are slightly different. And um, so the growth slows down before photosynthesis slows down. So what's that mean from a practical standpoint? What that means is that um, even though tall fescue is no longer accumulating dry matter, it's still carrying out photosynthesis. So what's happening is that it, the sugars and carbohydrates in that plant really increases as we move into the winter months. And that makes it a very high quality forage that winters well as we get into the winter months. So I, I'm sorry, I, I forget sometimes that so people aren't that familiar. So all stockpiling means is that we're deferring grazing on a, on a pasture or a hay field, and we're allowing that growth to accumulate. So we're stockpiling that growth. Most commonly done in late summer with tall fescue stands. So we remove the animals in August, and we let that grass grow until we get into November or December, and then we start to graze that grass instead of feeding hay. This is actually some um, stockpiled tall fescue. This is mid-December, and 16% and, uh, crude protein, 60% total adjustable nutrients or energy. That's exceptional quality as we get into February. Yes, sir? Right. Right, so it's, it's difficult to maintain a mixture of a cool and warm season grass and, and really optimize management for both. So normally we would plant um, most of our acreage in a cool season grass and then maybe 20% or 30% of our acreage in a warm season grass. 
and and then we could manage to optimize management in that warm season grass. If we have a mixture of the two and we graze it really hard in the summertime, we're going to shift that botanical composition towards the warm season grass in that mixture. And there's a really nice presentation on our YouTube channel. It's called um, Optimizing Forage Resources, and it talks about managing complex mixtures and pastures and how we can actually manipulate the botanical composition of that pasture by how we manage that grazing. Good. Yes, so so the place you should always start is, is with your local extension agent. Uh, he has local knowledge of your county in the area of the state you're in. And also, um, he has access to resources. So if he doesn't know the answer, he can call Ray or I or, or whoever else he needs to call to find the answer for your particular question. And he can make, he can make a local visit to your farm, too. All right, what, the point that I want to make with this slide is that stockpile tall fescue is um, almost always higher in forage quality than most of the hay that we make in Kentucky, almost always. So it's, it's a really good match for fall calving herds in the Commonwealth. Talk just a little bit about orchard grass, and Ray did a really good job with orchard grass. It, it is a bunch grass, so it kind of grows in clumps, and it looks like a sod, but the clumps are just really close together. As orchard grass and tall fescue stands, both bunch grasses thin out, we start to see clumps in, in pastures. The one thing it doesn't tolerate very well is close and frequent grazing. So if, if we're grazing very closely and very frequently in a pasture, orchard grass is going to tend to go out of that pasture. We see this happen in hay fields also with, with disc mowing. When disc mowers are not adjusted properly and we cut an orchard grass hay field, we're actually, um, we can actually really damage that stand with that close defoliation in the, in the hay field. Um, it's, it's what I consider a short-lived perennial grass, so it's going to last, you know, three, four, five years in most cases. Um, sometimes less than, than four or five years if, if we don't have optimal management. It's got some insect pressure. It's got some disease problems that we see coming into the diagnostic lab routinely. Um, horse people love it for a cash hay. Um, are there more poor, persistent varieties? And then there are some improved varieties, but at the end of the day, it's still, still orchard grass, and, and tall fescues still are best adapted forage species. Talk just a little bit about alfalfa, and some of you probably hear it referred to as queen of the forages. And, and sometimes, I mean, it's a great, it's a great plant, but sometimes I, I call it a pouty princess. And, um, and it is a long-lived, deep-rooted, drought-tolerant legume that's a very aggressive nitrogen fixer, probably our most aggressive nitrogen fixer. If you're not familiar with nitrogen fixation, it is when uh, the legume plant forms a symbiotic relationship with rhizobium bacteria. The bacteria infect the roots and form what we call nodules. Inside those nodules, the bacteria live. And the bacteria fix nitrogen from the air. The air we're breathing right now is 78% nitrogen. They fix that nitrogen into a plant available form and share it with that legume plant. In return, they get sugars and carbohydrates from that plant as an energy source. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Both are getting something out of it. Uh, an acre of alfalfa can fix anywhere between 150 to 250 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. So it's one of our most aggressive nitrogen fixers in terms of legumes. The reason I call it a pouty princess is that everything's got to be just right for alfalfa to be really productive. It's got to have good, deep, well-drained soils. It's got to have good high, it needs high fertility. It needs to be rotationally stocked like Ray talked about. And it can cause bloat in grazing situations. The best way to reduce your chance of bloat is by mixing grass in with it so it's not a pure stand of alfalfa. Red clover is probably one of our most important pasture legumes that we have. It's a short-lived perennial. If we use an improved variety, it's going to last about three years. Um, if we use a common variety, it can go away in as little as a year. 
has good drought tolerance, but not on the level of alfalfa. Doesn't have as deep a taproot. Um, excellent seedling vigor, and that's one of the things that makes it really well adapted to frost seeding. And if you're not familiar with frost seeding, that's simply broadcasting seed over a closely grazed pasture, usually done in February. And the freezing and the thawing causes little cracks to form in the soil that incorporates the seed. The species best adapted for frost seeding would be red clover, white clover, and annual lespedeza. I wish her, do we have an animal scientist here now? We can ask Donna or Jeff tomorrow and they can give you a better answer. But, but the clovers, the legumes can cause uh, estrogen-like um, compounds or have estrogen-like compounds which can interfere with reproduction. Some clovers are worse than others. I don't think alfalfa is terrible. Um, some of the clovers from New Zealand can be really bad in terms of um, uh, interfering with reproductive efficiency. So white clover um, is a really important pasture legume in the Commonwealth. There's three types, uh, small, medium, and large. The small would be what naturally occurs in pastures. It's kind of a, or a uh, we call it a Dutch white clover. It's a short leaf, very gro low growing to the soil. Um, and then we have a medium, which is kind of a cross of the small and the large. That would be a grazing type white clover like Durana or a Kopu too. And then we have what we call our large type or ladino type white clover. That's generally what we recommend for people to use. It has uh, more upright growth and higher productivity. It'll produce about three to five times as much dry matter uh, compared to a small or Dutch white clover. It has stol stolons, and that's one of the things that makes white clover kind of unique in pastures and kind of nice to have. So. I've got these grass plants, and as that grass stand thins out, it leaves a little space between those plants. It's nice to have something that can spread into that space that's not a weed. And, um, and white clover can do that with a structure called a stolon. And a stolon is a modified stem. Everywhere where there's a node on this modified stem, it can put a root system down, and that allows it to spread out into those areas that are open in the pasture and fill in nicely. So that's one of the benefits of... Um, of having white clover in your mixture. Annual espadiza is a warm season annual legume that's non-bloating. So, so animals can eat it and you don't have to worry about bloat. White clover can also cause bloat if it's in high enough concentrations in the animal's diet. Um, it's tolerant to low, annual espadiza is tolerant to low pH and lower fertility. You know, 60 or 70 years ago, there was a lot of annual lespedeza used in grazing systems. That's kind of gone a little bit by the wayside because we have more productive, improved legumes like red and white clover in grazing systems now. But annual lespedeza may still be a good fit, say, on some lower productivity pasture land or maybe a farm that you're renting on a short-term lease that you can't afford to invest in lime and fertilizer on that farm because you just have it on a year-to-year -year lease. Two types, Kobe, uh, more prostrate growth, and then Korean. Generally, we rec re recommend Korean lespedeza. Korean tends uh, to have a little bit higher yield um, than the Kobe type uh, lespedeza. And these and annual lespedeza can also be frost seeded. A nice mixture for frost seeding would be uh, four to six pounds of uh, red clover, a pound or two of ladino clover and then somewhere around uh, 10 pounds of annual lespedeza. Oh. So uh, a nice mix for frosting would be four to six pounds of red clover, one to two pounds of a ladino clover, or a large white clover, and then about 10 pounds of annual lespedeza. Per, per acre. Yeah, per acre. And you would broadcast that on in February when we're still getting those freezing and thawing events that will incorporate it onto a closely grazed pasture. We'll talk more about that. There's a um, presentation tomorrow called um, Revitalizing Rundown Pastures, I think. Um, Cerecia, Cerecia lespedeza is our only true perennial 
uh, warm season lagoon that's adapted to Kentucky. It's long-lived perennial warm season non-bloating lagoon, well adapted to states in the transition zone like Kentucky and Virginia and Tennessee and so forth. Extremely drought tolerant uh, and, and tolerant of acid soils. What's the bad thing about Cerise? <laughs> you hit it right on the head. It's not real palatable. <laughs> it is on some states' noxious weed list. As you move to the western United States, it's on quite a few noxious weed lists. Where do we find this at a lot of times? You hit it right. Road banks are one. Road banks. Reclaimed mine land. A lot, a lot of reclaimed mine land. Sometimes, you know, the guys that are grazing reclaimed mine land get up in a little bit of uh, arms when you talk about making nauseous weed because there's not a lot of other stuff that grows on reclaimed mine land except Ceresia lespedeza. So how would you manage this in the grazing system to, for it to be a profitable part of a grazing system? It really loses palatability when it gets up, you know, past your knee. So you've really got to be on top of grazing to keep it in a vegetative state. Once it gets up to your hip, you know, the animals are going to be looking for something else to eat in that sward. Um, where else might a fit be for Ceresia lespedeza? Any small ruminants in here? Small ruminant guys? So, yeah. So it's a natural parasite control in some cases. Tom Terrell's done a lot of work with that. Uh, uh, in, I think he's in Georgia with um, looking at Ceresia lespedeza as a part of a kind of a uh, comprehensive worming program for small ruminants. So it can be a fit there too. Tom Terrell is his name. He's one of the 1890 schools who, anybody know what 1890 school he's at? Well, we can I can find that out tonight before I uh, go to bed here. So there's a number of different cultivars of, of um, Ceresia lespedes out there, but there's really, for all practical purposes, only one cultivar that's commercially available, and that's AU Grazer uh, from Sims Brother Seeds. It, it was selected at Auburn University for lower tannin levels, so it's a little bit more palatable than the old reclamation type um, Ceresia lespedesas, and it was selected under grazing tolerance, and it was selected for finer stems. Still Ceresia lespedesa, but a little bit more palatable. Ceresia needs to be grazed rotationally, and, and one of the issues, if you're trying to get it established, it can be actually be pretty hard to get established because it has real low seedling vigor. If you're interested in this, we can talk more about it later. <laughs> Remedy. Remedy will, will kill it. No. From practical. Probably somewhere in the 15 to 20 pound range, but you really have to suppress that sod so that um, it gets a chance to get going because the seedling vigor is real low. Just wanted to mention Bermuda grass real quick. Um, we commonly think of that as a, a, a more of a tropical species or subtropical species that we would find in states like Alabama or Florida, but, but we actually have quite a bit of Bermuda grass naturally occurring in western Kentucky. And, um, and, and I think as our, our climate is shifting a little bit north and our um, climatic zones are shifting a little bit north, we're seeing more and more warm season grasses come into our pastures. Relatively little has been planted here because we've never really had the right infrastructure. So most of the improved um, Bermuda grasses were uh, sterile. So we had to establish them from pieces of roots and rhizomes called sprigs, and we used special equipment and had special sprig sources. Those were pretty common in the southern United States, but never in the transition zone. So we've never seen a lot of adoption. Now, in the last um, 10 or 15 years, we've had the development of cold tolerant seeded Bermuda grass types. And those ha really have the potential to facilitate adoption in the northern transition zone. They're small seeded like any other small seeded forage. Um, Probably not with a no-till drill, but with a uh, brilliant type cedar. They come as two, so cedar Bermuda grass is marketed either as a pure variety in a bag or a blend, and that can be a mixture of several different varieties. And the blends are usually branded, so that's, what that means in the seed business is I call it Ranchero Frio. And then um, I have several different 
cultivars in that bag. Well, the, the kind of the tricky side of that is that those cultivars can change from year to year, depending on what the seed company has left over. So it could be cultivar A and B this year, it could be A and C next year, and so on. So you need to look at the seed label and it'll tell you what varieties are actually in a bag. And then if you're interested in that variety, you can uh, run it by us and we can tell you whether they have adequate cold tolerance to persist here. We want to avoid any blend that has Arizona common or giant Bermuda grass in it because it, that, those two types of Bermuda grass do not have the, the toler cold tolerance to survive here. I just wanted to throw this up here to show you the yield potential of these in a well-managed system. So this is an average over a six-year period, and, and uh, we range from six tons of dry matter, and this was intensively managed, to, to seven and a half tons of dry matter. So the dry matter production is very high on Bermuda grass. It's a different animal than, than our orchard grass or tall fescue. Um, it's a much denser sward, and it's a much lower growing plant. So where we would cut, be, we would be used to cutting orchard grass for hay, you know, in the spring when it's up to your hip. Bermuda grass will never get that tall. It's going to be about this tall, and you're going to say, well, it's not even worth running my, my mower across that field. But then you windrow that hay, and you'll see how much actual dry matter is uh, in that sward because it's shorter but, in, but much more compressed. I, I threw this up here. I, this is a site that I did when I was in Virginia with Bermuda grass. And whenever I would go to a farm and I would see just like a naturally occurring Bermuda grass on that farm, I would pick up a few sprigs of it and take it back to the research station and start it in the greenhouse and then transplant it to the field. And what I want to show you is that, that they're not quite as good as some of the improved hybrids that you would sprig, but, but really they're not terrible. And some of these Local types of Bermuda grass that you may already have on your farm, especially if you're in western Kentucky, um, may meet your summer forage needs just with improved management. So, so we don't always have to reseed. We just need to think about how do I, how do I take that, what I already have, and improve my management to um, give me some more summer grazing. I put this up here, not so much to talk in great detail about uh, nitrogen fertility on Bermuda grass, but to show you that Bermuda grass, like other warm season grasses, responds to nitrogen fertilization. So you have to make that commitment up front. If you're going to grow Bermuda grass or a sorghum Sudan grass or a pearl millet or a crab grass, they all respond to nitrogen fertilization. If you're not willing to put nitrogen on, and nitrogen price is pretty high now, they may not be a good fit for your grazing system. Skip over this. Talk a little bit about crabgrass. We saw in that stand today where we put the calves that we had a significant component of crabgrass in there. Crabgrass is, is a summer annual grass. It's well, well adapted to a lot of different transition zone states. It's a true warm season annual, but it acts like a perennial through prolific reseeding. And that's one of the things that makes it a good, a good weed. We often think of it as a weed if it's in a row crop or in our wives' flowers, but it actually can be a pretty decent summer forage um, in a grazing system. The nice thing about crabgrass is it kind of fills in, and that's exactly what it was doing in that stand where we have the calves at. So we had that stand. It's a thinning perennial alfalfa in orchard grass. Um, there's probably some fescue in there. But as it thins, the stand opens up, and crabgrass has come in, and it Crabgrass finds a hole in the stand about six inches and it kind of fills those holes in. So it can actually be a, a nice component of a grazing system, especially if your pasture is thinning. Has good yield potential, not as high as Bermuda grass. Excellent forage quality, um, much higher than Bermuda grass. And animal productivity will be higher. There's no prussic acid formed. Prussic acid is formed in our sorghum species like Johnson grass, sorghum Sudan grass, Sudan grass, and forage sorghum after the cells rupture when we have a freeze or a severe drought, mostly freezes. And it actually forms prussic acid or hydrogen cyanide, and that can actually kill animals if they graze immediately after freezing. Uh, can accumulate nitrates like other, other summer annual grasses under high nitrogen fertilization. This is actually some Red River crabgrass. Believe it or not, there's about a half a dozen different varieties of crabgrass, and we actually have a crabgrass variety trial 
that you can go to our website and look up the productivity of different types of crabgrass. This was 60 days after planting. This was probably, I would say, um, two, two foot tall and, um, and completely vegetative, uh, just starting to get seed heads on it. This is the response to nitrogen. And again, I put this in here, not so much to talk about nitrogen fertility on crabgrass, just to stress that it's important that if we're gonna try to grow crabgrass, if we wanna increase both productivity and quality because in warm season grasses, crude protein is very closely tied to nitrogen fertilization. Um, we need to have that commitment to putting a little bit of nitrogen on there. Look, we, we would never recommend 305 pounds of nitrogen on crabgrass. You, you wanna be down here in this, this 150 pound range where that curve is still relatively straight applied as a split application, two or three applications of about 50 pounds to 60 pounds of, of nitrogen. So one place where it really excels is forage quality. We did work um, that showed 75 to 90% digestibility. In vitro digestibility is when we take that forage material and we put it in rumen fluid from the animal and let the microbes in that rumen fluid digest that plant material. So it gives us a better idea of how that, that forage is gonna respond in the rumen of the animal. Crude protein ranged from six to 14%. It was 6% at the very end of the growing season as we're starting to get frost. In growing season, it was uh, between 10 and 14% in most cases. And again, it increases with nitrogen fertilization. This is some interesting work from um, Oklahoma from the Noble Foundation. It was done by R.L. Downrimple, summarized in a 1994 publication. He had just um, years and years of stalker data on grazing crabgrass pastures. On a medium quality crabgrass pasture, he would expect gains of about a pound and three quarters a day. On a really good quality crabgrass pasture, they could exceed two pounds of average daily gain a day. So a very good quality uh, grass for the summer months. If you're grass finishing, you're milking cows, on, or you have a great grazing dairy, um, we're trying to put weight on some stalkers, crabgrass may be a good option for the summer months. This is perennial sudex, or what we commonly call Johnson grass. And don't, don't anybody leave this room and say, the forage guy said to plant Johnson grass, because I did not say that. <laughs> but but sometimes, sometimes we will have this naturally occurring on farms. And the question is, is do we fight it? And, and usually when we fight mother nature, we don't do too well. Or do we think about how we can utilize this as part of our grazing system? And um, this is, again, a sorghum species. It's a, a perennial species. Actually, it was introduced as a forage um, by Colonel Johnson in Georgia, um, and, and it kind of got out of control. And um, I grew up in Ohio, so don't get me wrong. You know, Johnson grass was a real problem in corn when I was growing up. Um, commonly find it on old dairies and bottomland. Um, Thrives under hay management. Where's one place we never, almost never see Johnson grass? In a pasture, a continuously stocked pasture. Why is that? It's pretty palatable, yeah. So, so they will tend to graze it out, and the way they graze it out is that in a continuously stocked pasture, it never gets a chance to rest. So every time it grows a little bit, that animal's right there and nips it off and nips it off and nips it off, and it depletes the carbohydrates in its uh, stem base and root system and eventually it dies under that type of management. Where we commonly see it is hay fields, where it really likes to be defoliated and then rested between uh, defoliation or hay cutting events. It thrives under that kind of a management. Like our other summer species that responds to nitrogen fertilization, can be good quality if managed. Um, and good management would involve harvesting for stored forage at the boot stage. Um, it does have prussic acid that can be formed and can accumulate nitrates under high nitrogen fertilization combined with drought. Okay, the boot stage is the stage of growth in a grass plant when the seed head, I'm glad you're asking these questions. There's somebody else probably sitting there saying I've got the same question. Um, it's the stage of growth when the seed head is just emerging from the last leaf of the plant is what we call that. The, when it emerges its early head, 
right before it merges, that last leaf, the sheath of it kind of swells up, and we call that the boot stage. That's our best in general for, for conserved forage harvesting. That's our best compromise between yield and quality. So we get pretty decent yield, and we get pretty decent quality. This is just some, some data from the Noble Foundation. And, and what I wanted to show you was that top 10 grasses of nutritive quality. Look who's at the top. Johnson grass. All right, I want to talk about sorghum Sudan grass and some of the other sorghum species and pearl millet real quick. When I was in Virginia, I did a lot of work with um, sorghum Sudan grass and, and uh, you know, we've been testing it. I've been testing it since the early 2000s, so about, about two decades now. And um, it wasn't until 2009 that I started to look at forage quality. And this was some data from 2009. So this was um, from a variety trial. We had, a, I think in this year, we had 22 or 25 varieties in the trial. So I just picked two of the top performing ones, two that were in the middle and two that were at the bottom to show you. And then they had a, a forage sorghum, a sorghum Sudan grass, Sudan grass, pearl millet, and then two more Sudan grasses. Some of them have what we call the brown midrib trait or the BMR trait. And you're saying, well, what is that? Well, that's when the actual, it's a phenotypic, so an outward expression of something that's different in this sorghum plant. It's a mutation that occurs in this plant, and it forms a brown midrib in that plant. They tend to have lower levels of lignin in the plant. And you're saying, oh, well, why is this guy telling me they have lower levels of lignin? What do I care about that? Well. Lignin is a compound that makes plant fiber less digestible in the room of the animal. So if we have lower levels of lignin, we tend to have higher animal performance. So we can actually have increased levels of performance with the BMR or brown midrib type varieties. We have some BMR corns, we have some BMR pearl millets, and we have um, a lot of BMR sorghum Sudan and Sudan grasses. Okay, so some of these had this BMR trait and some did not. Um, and then this was the yield at the first harvest here. So tremendous difference in yield at the first harvest between these varieties, 38 to 6,800 pounds. So, and then we had the forage quality data and there was tremendous yield or in the in vitro true digestibility when we put that forage material in the room, in the uh, rumen fluid and let the microbes digest it. 54 to 74% at the first harvest. So when I saw that data come back from the lab, I said, well, you know, those varieties that were 54%, they were the ones that yielded so much, a lot of stem, a lot of uh, mature plant growth in there. But when we started to match that data up, lo and behold, some of the highest yielding varieties were also some of the most digestible in the trial. And, and that kind of got me interested in this relationship between yield and digestibility. And we've tested a lot, and we've looked at this relationship a lot over the last several years. This is the impact of the BMR trait. So on average, we're about 3 to 5% higher in digestibility if we have the BMR trait. Sometimes it's a lot higher. So these values are averaged over all the BMR varieties and non-BMR varieties in the trial. So the dark bar is BMR, and the um, light gray bar is the non-BMRs. In Higher in vitro true digestibility is better because this means more of that plant material is going to be digested to the rumen of the animal. So on, in general, we're looking at a, an increase of 3 to 5% over all the BMR and non-BMR varieties in the trial. Some BMR varieties will be even more digestible, up to 10% more digestible compared to non-BMR varieties. So, so anyways, over the years, I've collected just reams of data like this, and, and I give these spreadsheets to people, and they look at them, and they say, wow, that's a great spreadsheet, and then that's the last time they ever look at it. There's just thousands of pieces of data in these spreadsheets. And, and what I wanted to do was try to figure out how to make this data more useful to, to producers, to select varieties, and we came, kind of came up with this method. And what we did was we indexed yield and digestibility against the average for the trial. So the average yield for the trial on the x-axis here would be zero. So we could rank all the varieties as either being above average or below average. We did the same thing for in vitro digestibility. Zero is the average for the trial. So they're either better than average or below average. And then we could divide this graph up into four quadrants. So if you look at this bottom quadrant on the left, these varieties had below average yield and below average digestibility. 
those are probably ones you don't want to put into your forage program. The ones you want to be looking at is up in the upper right hand quadrant where they have above average yield and above average digestibility. So not only do they yield well, they were also more digestible than average um, for the variety trial. So these are varieties that we might want to include in a grazing system. And then we kind of went through and we kind of kept track of how these varieties did from year to year. And when you start seeing varieties that have above average yield and digestibility, you know, for multiple years in a row, those are very robust varieties. And those are varieties that you might really want to think about putting into a grazing program if you have that opportunity. So where do summer annuals fit into grazing systems? They can fit several places. So if I'm in a fall calving system and I'm weaning these calves, and I want to have something really high for them to go on to in early summer. Um, it may be a good place for a summer annual. I'm not going to go through a lot of this because I know everybody's getting tired. But you can take a look at that. The other place that summer annuals fit very well is in, as a component in a renovation system. So if I have a cool season pasture that's kind of playing out or thinning out, I can actually come in there, I can control it or kill that pasture with a non-selective herbicide in the spring. And then I can uh, come in, plant a summer annual, I can graze that summer annual. And then I can come back, one more application of herbicide and reseed that pasture in the fall. So it's kind of part of a renovation scheme on the farm. And, and this works actually very well with novel endophyte tall fescue. So one of the goals when we seed novel endophyte tall fescue is to get rid of the toxic tall fescue plants in that pasture. And we can do that um, by using a renovation sequence that involves a summer annual. So herbicide, summer annual, graze it, hay it, and then a second herbicide, and then come back with a novel end to fight tall fescue in the fall. So we kind of went through that. So here's, here's kind of an interesting picture in this. Well, this is from a long time ago. This is my oldest son who's graduating from UK next semester. So uh, this was a while, and this is my dad who's now 87. Um, but the question is, is what, can you graze corn? Sure. I, we commonly think of it as a, a crop that we harvest as a grain crop, but, but we can certainly harvest it. And I think corn actually has quite a bit of potential for, uh, for extending grazing. This was a trial that we did in, um, in Virginia where we looked at from September until March, we looked at the, how the corn overwintered in this trial. So every month we actually took a sample of that, of that uh, corn crop uh, we had a, a conventional type corn, a grazing type corn, and then this was actually a, a sorghum species um, that was just uh, very stemmy and didn't produce any viable seed head. When we look at this corn, I mean, we had about 10 to 12,000 pounds of dry matter um, standing in that corn field as we went through the winter months. We, this could be a very viable option for extending grazing if we would come in. We wouldn't want to give them access to the whole corn stand at once. We would want to use some of the temporary fencing that Jeremy had and strip graze that corn, make them eat the, the whole plant. The ear will be the first thing they select, and then they'll eat the leaves and the husk, and then they'll come back and chew a little bit on the corn stalks. Um, this is actually the whole plant, total, total digestible nutrients or energy in that plant. These are the dotted lines of requirements for different animals. As you can see, um, for a lactating cow and even a growing steer, we're meeting the energy requirement um, with a standing corn crop. Now, where standing corn kind of comes short is crude protein. It's going to be a little bit lower, lower in crude protein than those animals need, so we'll need to supplement that crude protein in that particular situation to, keep sure, to make sure that we're meeting that animal's nutrient requirements for crude protein. And then I, I wanted to finish up with my favorite winter annual. So there's a number of winter annuals we can use in grazing systems. They include small grains, um, so barley, cereal rye, wheat, oats, um, can all be used as, as a grazing crop. But my favorite summer annuals, annual rye, a cool season annual, would be annual ryegrass. And it's just a wall of forage in the spring of leafy, high quality forage that's extremely palatable. We can also use this as a conserved forage, as silage or baleage in the spring. It's very, very hard to, to uh, cure cool season annuals in the spring, like small grains or annual ryegrass, as hay, dry hay. 
we just don't have the right conditions and the crop is extremely heavy. Um, so it's better either used as a, a uh, grazing crop or as a baleage or silage in the spring. And this is just some, some data showing the, the yield potential. So this is average yield potential, you know, of somewhere between three and a half and, and four tons of dry matter um, from a multi-cut annual ryegrass system. One of the one of the um, one of the differences between annual ryegrass and small grains is that we, once we cut a small grain in the spring or graze the growing point off, it's done. It's done. Um, annual ryegrass will continue to regrow until the temperature limits growth in the spring, and that usually occurs in June, sometime in uh, most of Kentucky. So let's put all this together into a comprehensive grazing system. You know, really our goal is, is to graze 300 days a year. In, in Greg Halleck, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Once we get above 300 days, we, the extra grazing days start to cost more than they're worth. So we may be better off to feed some hay for about two months in most systems in Kentucky. So this is a potential system for Kentucky and other transition zone states. We start off with our, our primary forage base, tall fescue. That's what most of our farms should be in. By modal growth, we've got a hump of growth in the spring, hump of growth in the fall, not much going on in the summertime when the cool season grass growth is temperature limited. First thing we can do to extend grazing is, is stockpiling. So if we can stockpile some of that acreage, we're going to be able to utilize this second hump of growth as we move into November, December, January, even February in some years, depending on how the winter is. And that's probably one of our most inexpensive ways to feed cows in, in states like Kentucky. So the second place we can attack is this summer slump in growth in our cool season grasses. So not much going on here in terms of active growth during the summer months. Some type of warm season grass, sorghum sudan grass, pro millet or crabgrass can fill that summer slump in during the summer months. And then we can come in and where we had that summer annual, we can always come back with a cool season annual in the fall, something like annual ryegrass or a small grain. We'll get some growth in, in late fall and early winter, some grazing potential, but most of the growth is going to come in early spring. And, um, and that can kind of bridge that gap uh, between that stockpile grass and when we start to see active growth in perennial grasses like tall fescue. Now look, it, it's important to remember it's a lot easier to do this on, on a PowerPoint than it is in the real world where we're fighting floods and droughts and so forth. Um, but, but the point that I want to make is that as producers, you have a tremendous amount of tools in that, in that toolbox in terms of all these forage species. And it's up to you to kind of open that toolbox off and up and figure out what's going to work on your farm and how you can kind of put it together into a system that's going to allow you to graze more days of the year. And it requires, it requires extended grazing requires management for sure. All right, and I'll leave you with that. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question is, is uh, sorghum Sudan, just not sorghum Sudan, but our sorghum species, so Sudan grass, sorghum Sudan grass, and Johnson grass. How long do you have to wait after frost until you can graze it? Essentially, what you want is you want those leaves to dry out, and that's going to be about seven days after that frost. You, you don't want any, after a frost occurs, the leaves will look water-soaked, kind of like the cells have ruptured. You want that to dry out. As that dries out, that um, prussic acid volatilizes away and it'll be safe to graze. Um, when we cure sorghum sudan grasses hay, that same process happens. And as it's properly cured, as it cures and it gets down to 18% moisture before we bale it, that uh, hydrogen cyanide or the prussic acid volatilizes away. Um, why do more people not like crab grass? That's a good question. Uh, I'm, I don't know. I, um, the, Horse people tend not to like um, foxtail in the hay because it can lodge in the cheek of the animal and cause an abrasion on the mouth, in the mouth area of the animal. I'm not sure about crabgrass. Crabgrass is actually uh, something that we used for um, horses. Um, my friend in uh, Virginia had um, 
pleasure horses, and we actually had a pasture that we rotated with crabgrass and annual ryegrass and her little grazing system for her horses. I know everybody's tired. Guys, I thank you for hanging in with us today. I know it was a long day. We're going to start back tomorrow at 8 o'clock.